Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. A series of study from the Holy Scriptures based on the book of Revelation by Mark Finley. Join us as we follow the vital topics that will be presented on this study, understanding God's messages and warnings on this last days of Earth's history. Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. Revelation reveals God's plan for the future and unmasks the devil's deception. Down through the centuries, the devil has tried to deceive people by introducing into Christianity false ideas. False teachers have come in. Heretical ideas have been promoted. But yet, God has constantly had a people who have lived for and believed his truth. That truth is clearly revealed in the book of Revelation. Revelation not only points to the future, but it leads us to the past so we can understand what's happened in Christianity and how to live today in the light of God's truth. This presentation is a powerful presentation that will help you to understand how one of the greatest heresies has entered into the Christian church and how God is appealing to us to be faithful to him. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for the light that shines on Scripture, revealing to us your truth for this end time of verse history. Bless us in a mighty way. Open our minds and our hearts and enable us to understand your word clearly and give us the courage to follow it. In Christ's name, amen. Our topic during this presentation is Revelation Reveals History's Greatest Hoax. Would you agree with me? That merely because someone says something doesn't mean the that the thing that they say is necessarily true. Would you also agree with me that because we have worshipped a certain way down through the centuries doesn't mean that that form of worship is true? Would you also agree that tradition and truth are two separate things? That human opinion and divine revelation are two separate things? That what man says and what God says are two separate things? Merely because something is believed, and if you believe it hard enough, doesn't mean that the thing which you believe hard enough is truth. Let me give you some examples of that. Let's go back to the days of Copernicus. In Copernicus's time, most people believed that the Earth was the center of our solar system or the universe. They believed that the Earth was stationary and that the planets and the sun, in fact, was revolving around the Earth. But yet, a free-thinking poll by the name of Copernicus began taking a look at that theory. He proved that it was not true at all, and he demonstrated that the sun is the center of the solar system and our earth is actually rotating on its axis and revolving around the sun. Because people believed that the earth was the center for years, they didn't make the earth the center. Or here's another example. Aristotle, brilliant philosopher, scientist, classified the spider as an insect. Now insects have six legs. So Evidently, Aristotle must have not accounted because he said the spider is an insect. It was John Baptiste Lamarck who sensed that although spiders have six legs, although insects have six legs, spiders are arachnids and they have eight legs. So a spider not having six legs like an insect couldn't possibly be an insect. People said, Lamarck is crazy. Look what Aristotle did. Just like they said Copernicus is crazy and they battled against his idea of the sun being the center of the solar system. Both these men experienced ridicule. They experienced taunting. Both of them experienced uh, persecution for their beliefs. But yet, 
merely because somebody said something and something was passed down through the centuries didn't necessarily make what they said right. Could it be? Could it be that a tradition like one of these long-held ideas has slipped into the Christian church? Could it be that many are guarding a tradition that does not have foundation in the Scripture? Could it be that there are thousands walking in the way of tradition rather than walking in the way of God's Word, rather than walking in the way of the cross, rather than walking in the way of the law of God? Could it be that the devil has deceived millions, even millions of Christians in embracing a tradition that they think is true? Let's go to the book of Revelation. We're going to journey through the book of Revelation. We're going to notice a titanic struggle between good and evil, between Christ and Satan, and see God's Word clearly revealing His truth for this end time. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. There's a great battle in heaven. Satan and his angels are cast out. And they're cast out into the earth. But what I want you to notice is the scripture says that Satan who's cast out of heaven, this dragon, is like the serpent. He's a dragon because he destroys. He's a serpent because he deceives. He deceives those whom he's going to destroy and destroys those whom he has deceived. The Bible says he deceives the whole world. Could it be that the majority of the world, including Christianity, has followed a tradition, a tradition that has to do with worship, a tradition that's at the very heart of a conflict in the book of Revelation between worshiping the Creator and worshiping the beast. Truth at times is stranger than fiction. And isn't it logical that if the devil wanted to attack Jesus, the devil would attack the law of God? which is the very foundation of God's throne and the very foundation of his character. Wouldn't it be logical that Christ, who is love and the very foundation of love, would have a loving law to guide all humanity to pathways of happiness? Because love is always manifest in obedience, just like the devil wanted to leave, lead Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to disobedience, so he has a plan to destroy the authority of the Creator. Now, isn't it also logical that the devil would attack the fourth commandment and the seventh-day Sabbath? You say, why? Because, you see, the Sabbath commandment is the basis of the entire law of God. Because when you read, thou shalt have no other gods before me, who says that? When you read, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, who says that? When you read, thou shalt not kill, who says that? Thou shalt not commit adultery, who says that? The fourth commandment, the bridge between the first four commands and the last six, tells us that the Creator is the one that commands. The reason God has the authority through Christ to command is because He created we as creatures created by God did not choose life, he gave us life. So we're responsible to our creator for obedience because he gave us the breath of life. So the devil attacks Jesus by attacking Jesus' law. He attacks Jesus as creator by attacking the Sabbath command, the fourth commandment, that is a sign of his creative authority. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 10. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So the seventh day is the sign of creative authority. God invites us to keep the Sabbath as a symbol of loyalty and obedience to him. Jesus kept the Sabbath according to Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. The apostles kept the Sabbath according to Acts chapter 13 verse 42 to 44. The Lord does have a day. Some people say what difference does a day make? But according to Revelation 1 verse 10, the Lord is a day. And according to Mark 2 verse 27 and 28, Luke 6 verse 5, the 
Lord's Day is the Sabbath day because the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So if the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath day, the Lord's Day must be the Sabbath day. Three times that passage is repeated. Luke 6 verse 5, Mark 2, 27 and 28, Matthew 12 verse 8. They all say that the Sabbath is the Lord's Day. Throughout the Old and the New Testament, God has a day. And the Lord's Day is a symbol of His creative authority. But why do so many keep Sunday? Who changed the Bible Sabbath? Certainly God didn't change the day that He wrote with His own finger on tables of stone. He says in Malachi 3 verse 6, notice it, for I am the Lord, and what does it say? I do not change. So God didn't change the day. He says, I'm the Lord, and I do not change. Who changed the Bible Sabbath? Jesus didn't change it because the Bible says Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13 verse 8, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he certainly didn't change the Sabbath. What about the apostles? Did they change the Bible Sabbath? They certainly didn't because the Bible says, Acts 5 verse 29, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So God didn't change the Sabbath. Jesus didn't change it. The disciples didn't change it. Who changed the Bible Sabbath? Could it be that in the early centuries, tradition slipped into the Christian church? Could it be that the devil had a plan to attack and destroy the fourth commandment? I'm going to take you on a journey a journey into history and a journey into prophecy. And we'll understand who did it, who changed the Bible Sabbath. It was changed by man in the days of compromise, not changed by God or Jesus or the disciples. Let's go right into the heart of the book of Revelation, Revelation 13. Revelation 13 describes a beast coming up out of the sea. Verse 1 says this, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now notice there are four beast-like figures in those verses. A lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon. The book of Revelation takes the prophecies of Daniel and puts them together. So to understand Revelation, one must understand first Daniel. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 7, because there we see the exact same four beasts, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon. Now, we might think that it's very hard or very difficult to understand Bible prophecy, but yet the same God that gave us prophecy explains the meaning of that prophecy. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 2 and 3, it says, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. In Bible prophecy, according to Jeremiah chapter 49, wind represents strife. It represents conflict, devastation, or destruction. Hurricanes, tornadoes, cyclones, destruction. So the winds are blowing on the great sea. According to Revelation 17, verse 15, the sea represents peoples. It represents nations. So you have conflict among nations. The Bible says, I saw four great beasts come up from the sea, each different from the other. In Bible prophecy, what does a beast represent? The Bible says, Daniel 7, verse 17, look at it. Do you see it in Scripture? It's very plain. The same God that gave prophecy explains prophecy. Those great beasts, which are four, how many are there? Four. It says, are four kings that will rise out of the earth. So a beast represents a king, or then he said, Daniel 7, verse 23, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on earth. So what does a beast represent? A beast represents a king or a what? A kingdom. So these four beasts in Daniel chapter 7 
represent four kingdoms. The first kingdom that rises is pictured as a lion with eagle's wings. Now here's another principle in prophecy. When God gives a time sequence prophecy, he always begins where the prophet is. Daniel lived in the days of Babylon. So hence, God begins describing these kingdoms with the nation of Babylon. The lion with eagle's wings is a fitting symbol of Babylon. You remember in Daniel 2, we don't have four beasts, we have four metals. Daniel chapter 2, there was a great image. Now the great image of Daniel 2 and the four beasts of Daniel 7 are closely aligned. In Daniel chapter 2, four metals. Head of gold, breast and arms of silver, thighs of brass, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. The toes, four metals. In Daniel chapter 2, the metals represent Babylon, the head of gold, Medo-Persia, the breast and arms of silver, Greece, the thighs of brass, Rome, the legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay represents divided Europe. Now notice the similarity in the four beasts. Again, Babylon would be represented as the lion, and we'll show you why. Medo-Persia as the bear, Greece as the leopard, Rome as the dragon, and then the ten horns, of course, the ten divisions of Rome. Now let's look at the evidence for this in prophecy itself. It says in Daniel 7 verse 4, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. A lion is the king of the jungle, the king of the beasts. An eagle is the king of the birds. So this first empire, Babylon, mighty Babylon that was the dominant nation in the world at the time, that ruled large expanse of the world, is pictured as a lion in eagle's wings. Is there any evidence of that outside of the Bible? There is. Come with me to the Pergamum Museum in East Berlin. Not long ago, I was there with a group that we took on a tour. This is Procession Way that is the wall lining the way into the Ishtar Gate in Babylon. The German archaeologist Robert Coldaway went down and excavated Babylon. And as he did, they pieced together what the wall would be like. And this is an original. These are not um, facsimiles. These are not reproductions. But they took the tiles from the wall of Babylon and pieced them together, put it back there in the Pergamum Museum. So as you walk along Procession Way as it's recreated, and as you look at these original walls, you see a lion with what? Eagle's wings. Fitting symbol of Babylon. Incidentally, the bricks in procession way, every one of them had the name of Nebuchadnezzar stamped upon them. So a lion with eagle's wings actually was the symbol of Babylon. The nation of Babylon did not rule forever. Another nation followed it. Daniel 7 verse 5. Suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said, thus to it arise, devour much flesh. What nation was it that overthrew Babylon? Babylon ruled from 605 to 539 BC, but it was the Persians that overthrew the Babylonians. Notice the Medo-Persian Empire. The bear lifts itself up on one side. What does that represent? Persia dominating over Media. What about these three ribs in the mouth of the bear? What do these three ribs represent? The Persian Empire raises itself up on one side, dominates over Media, but when Media Persia attacked Babylon, it also defeated two other nations, Lydia and Egypt, to conquer the world. So the three ribs Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. History follows prophecy like a blueprint. But the Bible says there would be a third empire that would rise. After this, I looked and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. You look there at the leopard-like beast with four heads and wings. What do you know about a leopard? A leopard is fast. 
Now, if you want to describe rapid conquest, what animal do you choose? A leopard. But if you want to describe rapid, 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 rapid conquest, what do you do? You put wings on the back of your leopard. What do you know about Greece? Alexander the Great at 33 years old, he conquered the world in rapid conquest. But at 33, he died likely of malaria in a drunken stupor. But yet, what happened? Four of his generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, then began to reign. So the four heads, the four generals of Alexander the Great, every one of these beast figures clearly describes that particular empire. The empire of Alexander the Great is fittingly symbolized in the leopard that attacks so rapidly, the wings that give it either more rapid conquest, and the four heads, his four generals. Why four heads? Because he would have four generals. But then another beast arises after Babylon, Medo-Persian, Greece. Daniel 7 verse 7, after this I saw in the night visions and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. Just as the fourth metal had iron legs, so likewise the fourth beast has iron teeth. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. How was it different? It was not succeeded by a fifth world ruling empire. It had ten horns, just like the legs of iron have ten toes. It was indeed divided. Just as the Bible described, head of gold, breasts and arms of silver, thighs of brass, legs of iron, four nations, lion, bear, leopard, dragon, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. What do you know about Rome? It was divided. Ro the Roman Empire ruled from 168 BC to 351 AD, but then it was divided. The barbarian tribes came down from the north, just like we have toes of the image in Daniel 2 of clay and iron. We have the horns of the fourth beast, the ten horns. Then Daniel introduces something new something that we haven't seen in the prophecy of Daniel, the second chapter. What is it? I was considering the horn. So he's looking among the divisions of the Roman Empire. When was Rome divided? Sometime between A.D. 351 and A.D. 476. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. So here is a horn that comes up among the ten called the little horn, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. So this little horn comes up, he plucks up three horns by the roots. There And there in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. So this little horn arises and... He eventually has eyes like the eye, he has eyes like the eyes of a man and speaks pompous things. He eventually becomes strong and powerful. Now notice some things about this little horn. Number one, he rises among the ten horns. So what are the ten horns? The divisions of Europe. So if we want to identify this little horn, we have to look at a European power. We're not looking at an American power. We're not looking at a South American power. We're not looking in Asia or China. We are not looking in Africa. We're not looking in Russia. We're looking deep within Europe. He arises among the ten, among the ten divisions of the Roman Empire, someplace in Western Europe. There's a second thing about this little horn. He arises after the ten horns. He doesn't rise in the days of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, or Rome. He rises when the Roman Empire is falling apart among the ten horns. So we've learned two things. If we're going to identify the little horn, we have to look in Western Europe. We have to look someplace between 351 A.D. and 476 A.D. He has eyes like the eyes of a man. Now what does that mean? What do eyes symbolize in the Bible? Eyes in the Bible symbolize wisdom. Remember what a prophet is called in the Bible? A prophet is called what? A seer. Why is a prophet called a seer? Because a prophet sees with divine eyes. A prophet sees with a divine wisdom. But this does not have the eyes of God. It has the eyes of what, everybody? The eyes of a man. So it, here is a system based on human tradition. Here's a human religious system based on man's teachings. So we would expect to see 
a human religious system rising out of the old Roman Empire in Western Europe from AD 351 to AD 476. Now according to the Bible this power is diverse. It's different than all the other horns. How would it be different? The other horns would be political powers. This would be a religious power. Daniel 7 verse 24 says he shall be different than the first ones. In other words, this little horn that arises would be a religious political power that would grow out of the Roman Empire after the breakup of the Roman Empire in Western Europe. It would be a religio-political power. What power was rising as a religious power and a political power out of Rome at the time the Roman Empire was falling apart precisely in those early centuries? Of course, it was the medieval of the Roman Church. What would this power do? The Bible is very plain. He shall speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High. How do you speak great words against the Most High if you're a religious power? What does it mean you'd wear out the saints of the Most High? In other words, it'd be a persecuting power and persecute those that did not go along with its religious ideology. And he would think to change times and laws. Notice the Bible does not say this power would change the law of God because no earthly power can change the law written with God's own finger on tables of stone. But he would think to change the time or the law. Truth is stranger than fiction. Down through the centuries, the saga is an amazing one as we journey through prophecy. This power would attempt to change the very law of God. He would think to change the times and the laws. According to Daniel 8 verse 12, this same power would cast the truth to the ground. He would do this, all this, and prosper. The devil would bring deceptions unknowingly, unwittingly, subtly into the Christian church. The very law of God would be changed. Changed not by God, but changed by human religious teachings. I wonder, how did the change from Sabbath to Sunday actually occur? How did the devil attack the very law of God, the fourth commandment that speaks of creation? How did he attack the Sabbath commandment? How did he change the very law of God? What historical circumstances contributed to that change and how did church and state unite to accomplish that goal? The change from Sabbath to Sunday occurred gradually. It occurred over a period of time and it was crystallized in the fourth century. The Bible Encyclopedia, page 561 by John Eddy says this, Sabbath, a Hebrew word signifying rest. Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshipped the sun. So Sunday, Deus Solus, the day of sun worship. Down through the centuries, pagans everywhere have worshipped on the day of the sun. You take the center image here and uh, with, it's an image out of Egypt, you'll notice the apis bull and he has the sun on his head. Sun worship, the Egyptians worshipped Amun-Ra. Far left-hand corner, you notice the Babylonian god sitting in his throne, but you notice the sun shining upon him. They worship Bel Marduk. Each of the images, far right you have the Persians and the Romans with Mithraism worshipping the sun. So the Sabbath always was a sign between God and his people. Ezekiel 20 verse 12, my Sabbaths I've given you as a sign between me and you. The Sabbath is a sign that God created us. The Sabbath is a sign that God fashioned us. The Sabbath is a sign that we rest in his love and care. It's a sign that he sanctified us and a sign that he's coming again for us to recreate a new heavens and a new earth. But Sunday, the largest luminous body in the heavens was the sun and men seeing that, they noted when the sun didn't shine for periods of time that their crops would be destroyed. Or if the sun shone too much, the crops would be destroyed. There would be a drought. So they worshipped the sun or the sun god. Constantine, the pagan Roman emperor who became a Christian, ruled from 
A.D. 306 to 337, that 31 year period, saw an empire that was falling apart. The Roman armies had stretched too thin. Roman lavishness and wealth and prosperity had eaten out the heart of the nation for useful work. They were consumed with entertainment and sports and pleasures and immorality. And the very heart of Roman society was falling apart. Constantine wanted to unite his empire. He also saw something else happening. The barbarian tribes were approaching from the north. They were on the borders of the empire and some of his empire was falling. Constantine believed that if he could Christianize the heathen, that he then could have a chance of saving the empire. What could unify the empire? Possibly sun worship. The pagans were worshiping on the day of the sun. Many Christians by this time had drifted from their faithfulness to Christ, although many were still worshiping the Bible Sabbath, but they also were worshiping on the day of the resurrection. They were beginning to do that. So Constantine thought to himself, I can unite my empire. I can do this by passing a decree. So here in AD 321, Constantine passed this decree. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest and let all the workshops be closed. Here you have the first Sunday decree passed in a compromise with an attempt to try to unite the empire from the pagans taking and overthrowing it. Constantine, the pagan Roman emperor, eventually united with the state powers. In the days of Constantine, church and state united. It was in the council of Laodicea that this was further established. The Catholic world on page 809, March 1994, acknowledges how the change of the Sabbath took place. In the book, The Catholic World, one of the most significant statements ever made regarding the change of the Sabbath said this, the sun was a foremost God with heathendom. There is in truth, our Catholic friends say, something royal kingly about the sun, making it a fit emblem of Jesus, the son of justice. Hence the church, now notice, not the Bible, not God, hence the church in these countries would seem to have said, keep that old pagan name, it shall remain consecrated, sanctified. And thus the pagan Sunday dedicated to Baldur, that's another one of the sun gods, became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. So you see what the book, The Catholic World, says. It says that the Bible Sabbath that was indeed part of God's word, that the Bible Sabbath was changed by the church, that the pagan day Sunday came into the church in an era of compromise. When we look down through history, the devil hated the Bible Sabbath. Why? Because he hated the Creator, because he hated God's law, because he led a third of the angels to disobey, he led Adam and Eve to disobey. So he attacks the Sabbath to do away with the basis or the significance of authority of the very law of God. Council Laodicea now takes this a step further and it condemns those who are worshiping on the Sabbath. Christians shall not Judaize. What did they mean? They shall not worship on the Sabbath and be idle. And I'm quoting from the Council of Laodicea on Saturday, but the Lord's Day. Now notice they're changing the idea from Sabbath, the seventh day. They call Sunday, contrary to scripture, the Lord's Day. They shall especially honor and as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on that day. If however they are found Judaizing, that's keeping the Sabbath, they'll be shut out from Christ. So what's happening? Two things simultaneously. Historically, the Roman Empire is falling apart. Constantine wants to unite it. Secondly, there have been Jewish revolts through the empire and Christians want to disassociate themselves from the Jews. So they begin honoring first once a year the resurrection, then they begin honoring the resurrection more frequently, and by the days of Constantine, you have many in the Christian church honoring the resurrection. Constantine and church leaders come together to unite the empire, but there are still those keeping the Sabbath. So the Catholic Council of Laodicea passes a decree to condemn them, saying that they are shut out from Christ. How was the Sabbath changed from the seventh day of the week, written with the finger of God, to the first day of the week? 
It was changed gradually down through the centuries as church and state had their own reasons. The church to disassociate from the Jews, the state to unite with the pagans, and together they coalesced and came together. Now remember what the Bible predicted, Daniel 7 verse 25, that this would take place in the days of the little horn in the early centuries, that they would think to change the times and laws. Now notice it does not simply say law of God. You know, there's only one commandment that has to do with time, and that's the Bible Sabbath. But it says times and laws, plural. Now, in Converse Catechism, we're going to come back to that plural business shortly, but let's look at how the church is very open in its admission of changing the Sabbath. Here's Converse Catechism. The Converse Catechism is a catechism issued by the Catholic Church with the imprimata in it that uh, all people converting to Catholicism would study from. And it says in the catechism, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. That's rather amazing from the catechism, isn't it? But notice it goes on. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Sabbath? Answer, because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. The catechism is plain. Our Catholic friends openly acknowledge that the church changed the day from Sabbath to Sunday, from the seventh day to the first day. Here's the basic question, though. Did the church have the authority to do that? Would anybody have the authority to change the Sabbath written with God's own finger on tables of stone? Would anybody have the authority to change a sacred day of worship when the Bible clearly predicted that a church state power would rise and make an attempt to change the Sabbath? Let's go to the Catholic Encyclopedia. Does the Catholic Encyclopedia acknowledge that the church changed the Sabbath? It does. Notice what it says. The church, after changing the day of rest, from the Jewish Sabbath, of course, it's not the Jewish Sabbath, it's the Sabbath of the Lord, it's the Sabbath given at creation, but this is what they say. The church, after changing the day of rest, from the Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. It openly acknowledges that the church changed the day from the seventh to the first, from Sabbath to Sunday. It is a little confusing, though. Why does it say the third commandment? is the Sabbath commandment, when the fourth commandment is the Sabbath commandment on tables of stone. Remember what Daniel said, they shall think to change times, and it didn't say the law, it said times and laws. How were the laws of God, the commandments of God changed? Well, here on the left, you have the Ten Commandment law. In that Ten Commandment law, you have the first commandment, thou shalt make no other gods before me. The second, don't make any graven images. The third, is don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The fourth, remember the Sabbath, and so forth, down through to the end. Honor your father and mother. Fifth, thou shalt not kill. Sixth, thou shalt not commit adultery. Seventh, thou shalt not steal. Eight, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Nine, and thou shalt not covet. Ten, the Catholic Church dropped the second commandment. That means there would be only nine. So what did they have to do? Divide the tenth into two. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and ten, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. So if you drop the second about images, so what happened? The laws of God, the commandments of God were changed. The Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday, seventh day to the first day, by man in a compromise, and the second commandment regarding images was dropped out of indeed that commandment dropped out of the, the whole Ten Commandment law. Now, there is a very famous writer by the name of Carl Keating, and he's written a recent book called Catholicism and Fundamentalism. It's the attack on Romanism by Bible Christians. He is a leading Catholic writer, very brilliant man, and the whole intent of this particular book is to show that the Protestant argument of the Bible and the Bible only, that that argument is invalid. Because what he's really saying is that the, that the Protestants who go by the Bible and the Bible only really ought to go back to the Bible Sabbath because there is no foundation in 
the Bible for Sunday. And so he's arguing that you have to have an authority outside of the Bible, and the only authority for the change of the Sabbath is the Catholic Church. So that's Keating's argument. And let's take a look at it. He says in Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 38 by Carl Keating, he says, fundamentalists meet for worship on Sunday. Yet there is no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. The Jewish Sabbath, or day of rest, was of course Saturday. It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. So here's what his argument is. His argument is, okay, you Baptists, okay, Pentecostals, okay, Church of Christ. He said, if you want to follow the Bible, you ought to go back like the Seventh-day Adventists do, he says, and keep the Bible Sabbath. But if you keep Sunday, you don't have any authority for that in the Bible, and you're really doing that in harmony with the Pope of Rome who changed the Sabbath, so you're acknowledging the authority of the papacy. That's his argument. Now, if you follow the logic of that argument, it's pretty logical. If you take the authority of the Bible, there's only one thing to do, and that's go back and worship on the Bible Sabbath, because it was in Genesis. Chapter 2, that the Bible says, God blessed the Sabbath, and God sanctified the Sabbath, and God rested upon it. 2,300 years before the Jewish nation, God set aside the Sabbath at creation. There were no Jews around at creation. It was in Exodus 16 that the manna fell before the Ten Commandments, and God said, don't go out on Sabbath and gather any, but worship me on my commandments. It was in the Ten Commandment law that God wrote with his own finger on tables of stone, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. It was all through the Old Testament. You know, God says, Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is what? No light in them. In other words, live in harmony by his grace, through his power, with his law. Now, somebody says, we're not saved by the law. Certainly, we're not saved by the law. We're saved by grace. But that grace that pardons us, empowers us to be obedient Christians. That's why Jesus said, if you do what? Love me. You will keep my commandments. So here is the real question. What is our guide? Is it the Bible or is our guide tradition? If you look around the world, you find that many, many are following tradition. They've stepped aside from the biblical teachings. The question is, will we follow the commandments of God written with his own finger on tables of stone, or will we follow the teachings of man down through the centuries. Men and women have been willing to stand for truth. Proverbs 23 verse 23 says, buy the truth and sell it not. Jesus said in John 8 verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You know, even in the Middle Ages in the Reformation, there were those that were discovering the Bible Sabbath. Karlstedt, for example, a very close colleague of Luther, began to keep the Bible Sabbath. Some of the Waldenses, in fact, many of them, kept the Bible Sabbath. John James, in the 1600s in England, was a Sabbath keeper. As the result of that, the authorities broke into his church while he was preaching on the Bible Sabbath, took him out. He was dragged through the streets of London. He was whipped. He was beaten, eventually beheaded. And can you imagine it? Because of his faith in Christ, because of his desire to follow Christ, he was this man of God was beheaded. And his head was placed on what they call a pail or a pole in front of his church the next Sabbath to warn anyone that might come and worship there. But yet, just as Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel. Down through the centuries, down through the centuries, Jesus Christ has had faithful men and women that would not yield their conscientious convictions. You see, God says in Psalm 89 verse 34, my covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Jesus says, 
that his word would echo and re-echo down through the centuries. His word would speak to hearts in every generation as I travel around the world. Whether I stand in the Kremlin in Russia, preaching the word of God, men and women whose hearts are open respond and follow God's truth and become Sabbath-keeping Christians. Whether it's in China or India or inter in South America, men and women today are stepping out. They're stepping out from tradition, stepping out from the teachings of men, stepping out from human opinion. They're making decisions to follow the Word of God. Let me tell you the story of five Russian sailors. These five Russian sailors were on a Russian submarine. And there, on that submarine, they had little to do. They found a book. The book happened to be called The Great Controversy. It is the story of good and evil, the story of Christ and Satan, the story of how the Sabbath was changed by man and not by God as they read the history of Christianity, as they read about the crisis that was coming in our world. These Russian sailors said, we must follow Christ. They were under the water, under the ice of the Arctic for six months in that submarine, reading that book again and again. One would read it, pass it on to the next. He would pass it on to the next. He would pass it on to the next. As they surfaced and came out, it was now Siberia. It's now in the month of January. These men came to a Sabbath-keeping Adventist church, and they said, Pastor, we want to be baptized. You want to be baptized? Have you accepted the Bible? Yes. Have you accepted Jesus? Yes. Have you accepted his commandments? Yes. We want to follow Christ. We want to be Sabbath-keeping Christians. The pastor said, well, we'll wait to the spring, you know, because the ice was a meter and a half in Siberia. These Russian sailors said, we can't wait. They went out to the lake. They took axes and chopped about four and a half to five feet of ice. They cut steps in the ice. And they said, Pastor, next Sabbath on the memorial of creation, we want to be baptized. They cut the ice on about a Sunday, and the pastor had to come and chop it because, you know, it gets so cold that I have to chop an inch, an inch and a half off every night. But the pastor said, I'm never going to be able to stand in that water the whole time. So every day, he would walk down those steps in Siberia, dunk himself in the water to get ready for the next Sabbath. Those sailors were so committed to Christ so committed to the Bible, so committed to truth, that in the middle of the winter in Siberia, they were baptized following Jesus Christ. You see, the question is not a matter of days. The question is, who's your master? The question is not a matter of one day or the next. The question is rather, am I going to follow the teachings of man or am I going to follow the teachings of Jesus? Am I going to follow human tradition? Or am I going to follow God's Word? You see, the real issue is what's the foundation of your faith? Is it the Bible or is it what man says? Is it human opinion or tradition? You see, the question is, what is the basis of authority in spiritual matters? Is it the church or God's will? See, if the church is the basis of authority... And if you believe the church has the authority to change the Sabbath, then you can accept Sunday. But if there's only one authority, and that is the Bible, if there's only one supreme authority, and that's Jesus Christ, if there's only one who can write with his own finger on tables of stone the Ten Commandments and say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. See, the church would have to have huge, immense authority to change the very law of God written with the finger of God. And obviously, the church does not have that authority. You see, in the Garden of Eden, God gave the Sabbath to Adam and Eve. The church would have to have enormous authority to change the eternal command of God that, to keep the Sabbath the day that God sanctified and blessed and rested upon. It has to have enormous authority to change the law given to Moses. 
Revelation chapter 14, verse 12 is an appeal. It's an appeal to your heart wherever you are today. It's an appeal to you in your home. It's an appeal to you in that hotel room. It's an appeal to you wherever you're watching this telecast. It says, here's the patience of the saints. You say, where are God's people today? Where can I find God's people? Here are those that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Find a group of people that love Jesus. Find a group of people that are keeping the seventh day Sabbath Saturday. Find a group of people that are believing that we're living in end times based on the prophecies of the book of Revelation. Satan came to the Garden of Eden and he said to Eve, Eve, what difference does one tree make? Eve, partake of that tree. Eve, it doesn't make any difference whether you eat of that fruit or not. She was deceived then partook of the fruit and lost Eden. The devil comes to people today and say, what difference does a day make? You see, the issue was not a tree and the issue was, is not a day. You see, with God, all days are not alike, just like all trees weren't alike. The tree was a symbol of obedience. And when Eve did not partake of that tree, she was obeying God. When she partook of the tree, she was disobeying God. So when she listened to the voice of the evil one, she disobeyed. It wasn't that tree because she, it wasn't simply that she took of the tree. It was the fact that she disobeyed God. And so God calls us to obedience. You see, here's what our choice is really, the Bible or tradition. Jesus or religious leaders, God's law, or man's dogmas, God's instruction, or human teaching, God's way, or man's way. Jesus reaches out to you, and he says to you, my child, I created you. I fashioned you. I set aside a day for you to acknowledge in a busy, hectic world that I'm your creator. I set aside a day for you to rest on as a symbol of resting in my grace and my love and care. You see, Sabbath isn't a symbol of salvation by works. It's rest, rest in his grace and care. And God's saying to you, come, worship on my Sabbath. I recreated, I created the world and I can recreate your heart. And every Sabbath as you rest, be reminded of Eden. Be reminded of the day that earth will be recreated. Reminded of the day that I will come again. Jesus says to you and me, choose you for yourselves this day whom you'll serve. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Will you make that choice today. Will you make that decision today. Jesus has his hand stretched out for you. I know for some, this is new. Why not pray right now? Oh, Jesus, I need you every hour, and I'm coming to you to make this significant decision to follow you, to keep your Sabbath, to walk in your ways. Listen, I need thee every hour. In 
joy or pain come quickly and abide or life is vain I need thee oh I need thee every hour I need thee Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, teach me Thy will. And thy rich promises in me fulfill. I save I come to be Is that your prayer my friend I need thee every hour Jesus invites you to come The Sabbath may be a new truth for you but Jesus says, I'll be by your side. I'll strengthen you. And Jesus says, step out. I've been convicting you by my spirit. I've been moving upon your heart. I've been revealing truth to you in my word. And you know deep within your heart that you've heard truth. And Jesus invites you to come, to make that decision that you'll follow him. Follow him wherever he leads. Jesus has not called us to the easy path. He's not called us to the common or the conventional. But he has called us to obedience. He has called us to follow him. He has called us to through his grace and by his power keep his commandments. Let's pray together. And I want to ask God especially for you that will touch your heart right now that will bring you deep conviction right now that he will give you the strength and the courage to follow him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that he trod the way before us. Thank you that he never leads us in a way that he doesn't give us the power to follow. As we feel convicted about the Bible's Sabbath, help us to put it pra into practice in our life. Help us to have the joy and the blessing of your day. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. We're delving deeply into the book of Revelation. We're unmasking the plans of the evil one and revealing the plans of God. So stay with us through this entire series and you will be abundantly blessed.